Hi, everyone. I see some names here that are absolute expert programmers. And so those of you who are experienced, uh, feel free to join the chat, um, add things in the chat. And especially if I do something a little bit uh, that um, is, is not generalizable or something that you'd like to uh, comment on, uh, let me know. Uh, please, uh, you know, go ahead or put it in the chat. Also, um, if you have questions, I might not see your questions, but there are enough experts that are joined uh, in, this, in this seminar that they will see your questions if you're on the Zoom call. And so feel free to chat, uh, chat away and, um, and join together. Let's, and then how do I, yep. And then I'm gonna get these view things over and over again, probably, right? Um, so uh, let's see, I'm gonna move this down. Um, so you saw the link. Hopefully what you did is you went to the Magnetosphere Online Seminar Series page. Uh, and if you scroll down, you will see a link to uh, the, the second data, basic data principles tutorial here. And um, if you click open in Colab, it will pop open this notebook. Now, if you attended last week's, uh, last month's tutorial, you'll know that this is um, Colab uh, allows us to share notebooks and you will be able to edit this notebook. But you, if you want to save your changes, you will have to uh, save, you'll have to save it locally on your computer, either save it as a copy or you can also just download it onto your computer. So you can manipulate, you can play with the notebook, but if you want to save it, you cannot save my version. You're going to have to save your own. Uh, and so welcome everyone to this uh, seminar series. And um, so the, uh, the um, let's see, I'm gonna move, oh, I guess I can't change that, all right. Um, so if we, uh, to review what we learned last month, um, this is a IPYNB is a Jupyter Notebook, um, which is a, it's an interactive share uh, annotated version of uh, Python code. And so, and in Google Colab, which we are using, this allows us to share and execute it together in, in the, in the, um, in, in a, in a web browser environment. Uh, there are two different types of cells. There's the code cell, um, and there's a text cell with, or a markdown cell, which allows you, so a markdown cell is something that contains texts for us to be able to manipulate. And if you want to double click in it, you can change it if you'd like. Um, or you can, and then a code cell is something that if you hit play, you can execute it. If you want to see the table of contents for this tutorial, there is, um, you can click on this little bar here and this will show you where we are. So um, as a review, uh, you can go to the Moss Python page and see the intro lecture and, uh, and uh, but just to quickly review again, this is a markdown cell. This is a code cell. Um, and so, if you see, um, if you see the, uh, what you'll see is brackets here. That um, if I go, if you go in here, you'll see that the um, you'll see a two, and that two means I've run it. I, that's the second command that I ran. If I run it again you'll see that now there's there's the, uh, this is the fourth time, the fourth command that I've run. Um, now this one says three, notice that this is this one says four above and three below, which means that I've run this top one after I ran this one. So if I run this one again, it'll update to five. And so it's a little, uh, so these interactive notebooks are very nice, but they're not, unless you just run it all, together, um, they're not sequential and that can be dangerous. Uh, so you can, um, so I can run it and uh, see the, uh, see the brackets increase. Um, and that'll tell you whether you've run it and in what order. Anyways, also remember, yeah, to save it. So, um, so this, this uh, brings us a little bit more into Python in particular variables and syntax. And um, like most programming languages, Python has standard ways that you, you define and manipulate variables and information. Uh, so there's basic syntax and input output. There are data types and different types of variables. There's the way you operate and, um, and, and uh, use functions. 
there are loops and conditionals. There's the for loop and the while loop and this different types of loops that you typically see. Um, there's of course the way you want to display your data and examine it. And there's a lot of extensions, packages, and libraries. So um, it would be very difficult to cover all these items. And so this tutorial is here to familiarize you with syntax data types and data types and start you manipulating the data a little bit to prepare you for the coming tutorials on data manipulation and display. And finally, machine learning. So let's start with simple variables. Um, so if anybody is having trouble accessing this, please uh, put it in the chat. And um, Kyle is monitoring it well, as long as, as well as other people. So please go ahead and put it in the chat. Um, but so this is a, this is a code cell. Uh, and um, if you notice this, this square bracket here, it has not been run yet, it's blank. And so, um, and you can, so this is a runnable cell, but um, if you want to make comments within a code cell, you put a hash in front of it. Anything following the hash is ignored by the interpreter on that line. So uh, you can put these comments in your code. You can either annotate them using a text box like this or a markup cell, or you can just put it directly in the in the code cell, which helps you, um, which which will execute, which is which in, in the executional environment. Um, and so, so here we have um, some comments on how to define variables and what kind of variables there are. Now, um, Python has what's called dynamic types meaning that um, you can declare a um, you can declare a variable, you can define it. And um, if Python, uh, based on some structure within Python or some protocol, it can change that variable type based on the interpretation. So um, in C, if you de define a variable type, variable type as an integer, if you then try to modify that variable and give it a floating point number, it will not let you it'll throw an error. But in Python, you can do something simpler. You can define A equals one point or 1.1 1 .1 or whatever, anything that has uh, is not clearly an integer and it'll, it'll make it a float. Um, whereas if you do not give a period after that, it'll assume you want it to, want it to be an integer. Uh, there's also a string. If you put quotes around it, you can put single quotes or double quotes. Uh, both work in um, both work in Python, um, but you can define a string. And so let's do this. Um, I will run execute this cell. And if you execute your cell, what you'll see is this is a float. This is an integer, and we can print all three. And the way you print it is I have a string here that just says A, B, and C are. That is a separate string that I'm printing directly. And then it's referencing these three variables and printing them out. So A, B, and C are 1.0, even though I had a one, it made it a 1.0, so it's clearly a floating point, two, and this string. Now, if I put C equals 3.1, um, even though I previously was defined as a string, I did not redefine it, I did not say, I did not change the variable type, Python knows now that um, it's assuming that we need to, that C is now a number rather than a string. Well, you can put that there and then we can redefine C as a string and it, it's fine. Um, it's, it's, oh, sorry, maybe we should have, wait, it's confusing. So we're talking about C is the language here and C is the variable. Um, but in the language C, it would cause an error uh, because we'd previously defined C to be a different type. And so it's nice, but it's a little, it's a little, it, it can cause pitfalls. And we're not saying that Python doesn't have its potential pitfalls. Um, there are things that are straightforward in other languages that can be difficult to handle, but the data declarations couldn't be easier. So we're gonna have a little bit of fun. Here's exercise one. Take a look at the um, different variable types. And so the way that you figure out what variable type it is, if you're not sure, is you can feed it to the function type. And um, so if you run that, if I say what, if I define A equals seven and I put type of A, it'll tell me that it's an integer. That's our output box. Um, and so, and also if you do this, if I say print 
type of A, if I feed it to the print function, it'll give me the same, it'll tell me that the, um, it'll print out what, it'll print out that it's the class, uh, the class is integer, but if you just feed it, if you just put this on the line, um, it'll return directly the, the, uh, the, the type. And so um, sometimes, so it's kind of, it's kind of handy if I do this though, uh, if I just put a, what it does is if it's not, it'll, it'll only return the most recent, uh, uh, very, most recent um, variable that you put on the line. So it doesn't put int and then seven, it only puts a. So if you wanna print more than one thing, you have to feed it to print. Anyways, and so um, the type of a is an integer. Now for your exercise, I want you to define a variable called a to be an integer equal to seven. And so you're gonna edit the lines below. You're gonna take the hashtag away and you're gonna make it an integer of seven. And if you run it, if you put print type of a or just type of a, if you do that, you can check and make sure it is an integer. Um, and so, what we want you to do is to define a variable called a and then check by entering it to make sure it's an integer and then define a string called b which is the character seven enter and check to make sure that you've got a string when you've got a and b defined properly print a times b and see what happens did it make sense did you so take Define them and then guess what you think A times B is going to return and then see what it does. Um, so we'll give you a couple seconds to go through, or maybe a minute or so to go through this exercise. Um, try to run different, try to do, um, try to do the exercise and I'll, I'll monitor the chat and then um, see how it goes. So as you're working through this, I also want to make one quick comment. Um, beyond being dynamically typed, Python is also case sensitive. Um, so a number of languages that we've worked in are not case sensitive. Um, IDL is not, which is fairly common within our field. I'm not sure about MATLAB, um, but that is something uh, to keep track of. Um, so in the example Barbara has here, um, if she was to change the variable name to capital K and try to print, she would get an error um, because Python because of the case sensitivity within Python. Uh, Barbara, you are on mute. Ah, uh, great. So Kilov. Uh... Majmudar, I'm sorry if I mispronounced that exactly. Oh, good, good. And so we have we have a um, someone got an error. If you Python actually pays attention to spaces, and so if you have a space in front of uh, a, a a line, and it is not being used to uh, it's so Python keeps track of your your nested uh, code by um. If, if you put a space in front of the line. And it's very useful because if you get a lot of loops in your code and you're trying to track down and you have functions defined and things like that, you can lose track in, um, in a language because in a language <coughs> like C, because it doesn't really pay attention to the spacing in front. Python is very picky. 
If you put a space in front, it's going to interpret it as being um, as being a, a as as being part of a a subset of code. Um, and so, if you're getting the error, if you're getting the unexpected indent error, remove the space in front, and it will execute okay. Yeah. Yes. So All we'll right. So um, that. yes. Sorry. I I was just going to follow up. We'll discuss more of that um, with a few more examples in control flow, um, which will be part of the next tutorial. And as Barbara said, um, the white space helps define blocks of code within Python. And we'll start getting really clear examples with like for and if statements, where instead of using uh, parentheses um, or braces, like in some languages, uh, or begin and end statements, uh, Python uses white space to separate all these blocks out. Um, and we'll have more examples on that in the next tutorial. Yeah, it's blocks of code. I was stumbling on the on the on the word. Uh, thank you. Yeah. So um, yeah. And so if you did the exercise, you're going to see something um, which uh, some of you might not have predicted that um, if you define a equals an integer and b as a string, um, if you multiply seven times an integer, this integer seven, you're going to get 49. But if you multiply seven times the string, you get seven, 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 which is um, which is how. Um, and so it's nice. It's flexible. But that's how interesting things can happen. That's why it's nice to have an environment that you're coding in that is a um, that um, allows you to debug things and report things very easily because you can, there are, I'm very good at exactly typing something that makes sense to me and, does, and doesn't and does do what I think it does. Um, and so, but yeah, I think, did anybody try multiplying the floating point uh, seven times the uh, times a string? So I can do, I can do a star b and it'll give in seven, 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 right? And then, but if I do c star b, which is still c is a seven. C is still seven. It's a floating point seven. And b is the string seven. But let's try this. Now let's run this this time. And it's going to give me an error. Um, so you can multiply an integer by a string, and what it does is it, it yeah. And so what it does is it re, it it um, it repeats. It just gives you a. Well, actually, here let me just do this. And what it does is it returns. It returns a string of seven sevens. Um, how, but, um, but if you type, if you do a, again, if you do what you, looks the same, it does, uh, C is a, go away, go away. C is a, um, is a floating point times B. It will give you the error because the floating point is floating point does not, uh, can be equivalent, can, can equal an integer, but it's how, if you had 7.1 as your floating point, how would you do 7.1 times a string? How would you repeat that string 7.1 times? Um, and so Python, it throws an error because Python says, I don't know what you want. Uh, you know, do you want me to make a sliver 1.1 one, 1. 1 of the character seven? That doesn't exist. And so, yeah, so it gives you the error. Um, let's see. And so, yeah, so this can be, um, it, and I, I, it can be frustrating. Um, and, and uh, you know, because as you're trying to understand the different variable types and the ways that they behave, um, sometimes that the way you think something's going to return something isn't, isn't the way that you expect. But don't get discouraged. And I like to think of it like you're learning to conjugate verbs in a foreign language. Uh, you know, so if you're trying to learn English, uh, I am, you are, he is, she is, they are, um, it's, it's, and they will. You know, there are so many different ways to say to be. Why can't we just say be? Um, you know, and so what you do is over time, it just becomes intuitive. You get used to it um, and you and you and you get a feel for how it's going, how how the syntax flows and how the on how the how the um, how Python responds. 
And so, um, and just like any language, when you're learning these verb tenses or the way things are, uh, it can be difficult to keep track. So you keep looking them up. Um, you can look, you can look up the uh, the different ways that you manipulate variables and you display and you and you report variables. Uh, keep looking it up, and then over time, you're gonna it's gonna make sense. Um, and so, next to dynamic typing. Uh, one of the powers of Python are many different types of built-in uh, data structures. Now, Kyle, um, I know I'm supposed to hand off to you. Is this the time? Uh, yeah, I think this is a okay. good place. Great, great. Okay, so um, we're going to be we're going to go into some more in-depth data structures. All right. Uh, thanks, Barbara. Um, so just to follow up on what uh, Barbara was uh, finishing with, um, Python is not a data analysis package uh, or language. And that's where some of the mix-ups come between what we generally have in the languages we're used to that have been developed specifically for data analysis. Um, so as scientists, when we think of multiplying something by seven, we don't think of multiplying a string seven times. Um, but as a programmer, that's quite intuitive. If I tell, if I give a computer a command to say seven times a string, that probably means I want the string to come out seven times. Um, as we move on through the tutorial and get into things like NumPy, Pandas, and SciPy, this is when we'll start importing packages within Python that make Python more of a language that we're familiar with. And we'll see that as the tutorials go on. Um, so with that, uh, what I will start discussing is the data types which are inherent within Python. Um, so data types that we're gonna be somewhat familiar with, but that are still uh, somewhat different than what we have in other languages that we're used to. And so within Python, uh, there are four key data sites that we have and that we often use that are very similar to arrays, but with slightly different functionality. Uh, so the ones that we have, we have a list, uh, which is like an array, which has a simple of assignment that uses square brackets. And within a list, we can put many different types. So a list isn't specifically defined to, to be one single type. Here we have three integers, but within a list, we can also add integers, floats, strings, uh, basically any data type or object type within Python. Now within those lists um, or within these types, we also have uh, built-in methods, which we'll be talking about. And within a scripting language, these are very helpful. Um, they make doing simple things quite fast. And we'll show a little bit of that. And that's restructuring array, doing multiplications, appending stuff to an array. And we'll go through a little, a few examples of that. Um, now, given the short time, uh, we don't have time to go through all of them, but we'll go through a couple of the dis uh, couple of these uh, different sets and talk about some of the key principles within Python with these. So first off, let's have a look at what a Python list is. Um, so lists are like an array. Um, they're a sequence data type, uh, so they're indexed, much like arrays we have in MATLAB and IDL. Um, within Python, our indexing starts at zero. So the first element is zero, the next element is one, two, and three. Um, unlike other languages though, lists have quite a bit of functionality in that we can have any type of data type within them. So within many languages, if we create something like an array, it has to be confined to that data type. Whereas in Python, these inherent data types, we can, within them, nest different types of data, um, but also have different data types. So as a quick example, if we look at uh, the cell here, uh, we can have a look at a couple different uh, key elements of what a list is and what these data structures are within Python. So like uh, most languages, uh, we can assign or create a list by saying a is equal to brackets, square brackets, the element that we want, and then separate each element by a comma. If we use an inbuilt function length, we can determine what the length of the array is, so how many elements of it. Similar to other languages, we can also re 
assign a value um, or an instance of A. So in this particular one, if we say A is equal to zero, then we get, or A zero is equal to 300, this will reset the first value of A to 300. Now, the next little bit is again, where things get a little bit odd. So in many of our computing languages, we often think of math um, when we do an operation like two times A. In Python, we're gonna get something slightly different. Um, so if we run this, uh, it is quite intuitive. Um, we get the length of A is a size five. If we rerun this and print A, after reassigning it and run it one more time, we see that the first element is 300. So everything that we're quite used to. However, this is where we get into something weird when we start applying multiplication. So if we run this one more time and do multiplication, sorry, uncomment and print, what we find is that we actually get A printed twice. Or actually what we've done is we've not printed A twice, but we've doubled A. So we've taken the first set of A and then created it again. So this is again, slightly counterintuitive to how we work. Um, but again, this comes down to Python being a computer language as opposed to a data analysis language. Uh, we'll get into the more mathematical parts as we go into NumPy and the other packages. So within Python, we can also create a zero length list. Um, so this would be an empty list that we might wanna fill within a for loop or as we're reading in data. If we run this with commenting these out, we just see that the length of A is zero, but then we can create a new list. Here we're using the range function. And what this is, is this is something similar to the generating uh, sequential uh, numbers within a list like what we often do in IDL. Um, I'm often going to be referencing IDL because that was the language that I started with before moving into Python. And so what range does is it'll start, it'll create an integer, a an integer list starting at 10, and then it'll go to 100, but not inclusive. So it's not going to include 100. It's going to go to the element just before 100, and it's going to do a step size of five. So if we run this one more time, we see that we generate a list of 10 to 95. Now this is a common feature in a Python, which you'll see across all of the packages, is that when we are looking at arrays and defining, or, and defining lists or ranges in this fashion, it's never inclusive. And so that's a common feature of Python, which is slightly different than a number of the other languages that people are used to. Now, one of the other key concepts within Python that is slightly different from other um, languages that we have is that the different types within Python, we have two different kind of classes of th these variables. We have immutable variables as well as mutable, mutable variables um, or types, sorry. Uh, within Python, an immutable type is a type that can't be changed. So once we've defined it, we can no longer change it. Whereas a mutable element, a mutable data type, like the list that we had before, we can define it and then we can start changing elements of it. We can increase its size. We can reverse its order. We can apply a number of different functions to it. Now, one of these data types is a tuple. Um, and so a tuple is very similar to a list. It's defined in the same way, but it uses parentheses instead of brackets. And now the biggest difference between a list and a tuple is that once we define the tuple, we can no longer change it. So it's an immutable object. Uh, so if we create the tuple, b is equal to one, two, three, four. And then if we print b zero, we will, much like a list, print the first element of b, which is one. However, if we try to reassign the first element b zero to two, what we get within Python is an error. And so this is because there are two different, this is the difference between an immutable and an immutable data type within um, Python. We'll talk a little bit more about that and some of the consequences when we get to the, uh, a little bit later in this tutorial. 
So the other thing within Python that is really handy is indexing and being able to index different portions of an array or different portions of a data type. So indexing allows us to grab different elements of a list or a tuple, or when we get into NumPy, different arrays. Within Python, it always goes, it always starts at zero, um, much like IDL, and it goes to n minus one. So if we have a five element away, we start at zero and we go to four. However, one of the cool things in Python, and which is fairly new in a number of other languages, is that we can also use negative indices. So instead of, if we wanted the last element, instead of knowing the length of the array, what we can do is use a negative index. And this starts with negative one. So if we want the last index of an array, we can say print error or of a list, we can say print a or a negative one, and that will allow us to access the last index. And now this goes from negative one to negative two, negative three, and then to negative n, where n is the length of the array. So we can go through a couple of these examples here. Um, we're still working with the same a that we had before. I'll just comment these out quickly. If we print a, we get the range of integers that we had before when we created the index or when we created the list. We can print the first or second element of the array by just using the simple bracket notation in zero and two. And that'll give us 10 and 20, so zero, one, two. And then we can do negative two as well. And what that will do is give us this, or sorry, negative one here, that'll give us the last indice, 95. The other cool thing about Python is that we can access a sequence or a number of elements within array by doing something what is called slicing. And so what that does is it takes a portion of the array and prints it to screen, or not prints it to screen, but allows you to access a portion of that array. And so if we do something like zero to two, this will print a number of elements from zero to two. Now, like the range formula that we used before, this is not inclusive. So what this will do is it'll print just zero and one. And so if we do that, or sorry, the zero and the one element. So we get 10 and 15. The same thing can be done if we use a negative indice. Um, we can print from the second last. And if we have nothing at the end of the colon, which is defining our slice here, sorry, zero colon two is defining the slice that we want access to. Then what we get is printing from the second last all the way to the last. We get 90 and 95. So what's handy with this is that we can do different things. Uh, this is a really good way to copy certain elements of a list to another variable. In the case here, we can copy from the third to the 15th element of A into B. Now, what the second colon here is telling us is that we are gonna do this in steps of two. So if we print A and start off simple, we'll just get the normal array that we were working for, steps of five from 10 to 95. If we look at B and print element three to 15 in steps of two, we're gonna start at the third element, which is zero, one, two, three, which is 25. And we're gonna go in steps of two, 35, 45, up to element 14. And so if we print that, we can just nicely see that. We start at 25 and go up to 75. We can do the same thing with C. And if we remove the last colon here, all that's telling us is that we're moving through the in, moving through the data type in steps of one. So it starts at 25 and we go all the way to 80. Uh, now the last thing we'll look at is just a little bit of manipulation of the list um, and a little bit of printing. Um, so again, if we define the list, we do list range 10 to 102 in steps of five. Unlike the last one, since our last element here, we want as 100 to two, we'll, go, we'll be going fully to 100. Now for printing these objects, we have a number of different ways of printing them. Um, if we want to bring them to screen, we can simply print, uh, we can separate them by commas, or we can use the formatting command, which allows us to print various uh, data types with a specific format. So the first element here, we can put the last entry zero as um, an integer, I believe, and as the second one, 
And the last one is in as a, just simply prints a new line. Now this indexing or slicing works the same way for strings as it does for lists. So if we have a string that is more than one character, we can start slicing and indexing the, uh, the different elements of the string. Uh, so in this case, if we print the last elements of the string, we get G. And if we print the last, the second last element, we get N. Now this indexing, it's quite nice. It's quite handy within strings. It makes it a really easy way to start identifying file types. And I found it really helpful for, re for determining what file type I have and what I wanna read in within Python. Now indexing and slicing, well, particularly slicing is a really powerful tool within Python. Um, and there's a few more examples on the real Python page here uh, that you might wanna go through, which will be really nice and give a pretty good handle on how slicing works and what its utility is within Python. So now moving on, we just wanna talk a little bit about notes about Python data types. Um, you've probably heard me use the word object a few times within this, and I have not described what an object is. So Python is an object-oriented programming language, much like C++. Um, IDL also has some elements of object-oriented programming now, and so does MATLAB. An object within a programming language is essentially anything that contains data. Um, along with that, it has some associated metadata as well as functionality. So within Python, everything that we use, everything that we do is an object. So we defined it a list. A list is a type of object. We defined an integer. An integer is also a type of object. Now, the nice thing about the objects or the object-oriented programming is that within that, objects tend to have attributes and this is some sort of data that is associated with the object that we created. Um, for uh, integer of lists, it would be the type, it could be the length of the list. And then within that, we also have methods. So these objects have very simple inbuilt functions or methods, which allow us to quickly access or manipulate different objects or different portions of an object. And so if we want to do something like determining the length, appending to a list, uh, reversing a list, these are often built-in functions within an object that make it very rapid to manipulate it. Now, if you want to know what's within an object and the different methods, there are many different ways to determine or to kind of get help on the functionality of an object. And one of the most important ones is Google. Uh, Stack Overflow is also very important. Uh, it provides a number, or it is a huge resource for coding and for solving problems when you're down in the mud and can't figure uh, what can't figure out what something is doing. And then there's also the Python Python docs. So the nice thing about Python is that it's a very very well documented language, and you're going to be able to find answers to many of your solutions very quickly. And that's not only Python, but also the very the key packages that will be that you'll be using within Python. However, um, like many other languages, Python does have some built in functionality, which will allow you to kind of get an idea of what an object of what an object state is and what methods you can apply to it. So some of these is or some of them that are simple is the dir. Um, the built-in dir function. And what this will do, this will just tell you very simply uh, the different attributes and the different um, methods that um, are associated with an object or a variable. And so if we just type dir a, and if we hit uh, run here, we get a list of the different inbuilt or magic front functions, which are the underscores. These ones here, they tell an object what to do in the add case if we say a plus b. So this built-in method just tells uh, Python and the command interpreter what to do if we take a and add it to something else. The other objects here, or sorry, the other methods here, they're uh, much more simple and they allow us to manipulate the object that we work with. And often they are quite descriptive just from their name. So append, will allow us to append something to an object or to the object. 
clear in this case for a list, we'll empty it. And then we have several others. Now the dir, it's kind of fast and dirty. It doesn't give too much um, or too much info about what we're using. Um, import the inspect uh, module provides a little bit more information, but that's slightly complicated. And we can often get around this by simply using tab completion. So tab completion is something which is really helpful within Python. It's available within IPython, Jupyter Notebooks, as well as Google Colab here. And what that does is it'll allow us to get some information on the different methods that we can apply to an object. And so to apply a method, we always use the dot syntax, which is here. So if we want to look at the different methods that are we can apply to the list that we have here, um, we can hit a dot. Now, if we're in IPython or Jupyter Notebook, we would just hit tab. Um, however, we are now using Colab and the functionality is slightly different. So to use the tab completion, it's actually control space. So if we hit control space, it'll tell us the different methods that we can apply to our object A. And they're listed here. Um, the help command does something similar. If we type help A, it gives a little bit more information than the dir um, object. Here, it tells us what kind of object we have, list. It tells us the methods we have, as well as the methods that we can apply, append, clear, and copy. We can get a little bit more information on each of those by typing them. Help on built-in function append. All this does append an object to the end of the list. And then finally, we can also do uh, the question mark, which is very similar to the help. However, it opens a separate window and it gives you a little bit more information on the type we have, what the string form looks like, its length, and then a very short doc string, a uh, document string describing what it is. Uh, we can do the same thing with a.append and it'll open another window and it'll just tell us what the append method does to the list object A. So if we close those, we get back to our normal site, our, our normal uh, window here. So we can have a look at those. And here, we'll just be looking at, very simply, uh, one of the methods, but also um, the um, versatility of some of these uh, uh, data types in that they don't have to hold a single data type. So if we print A, we're going to get our list of integers. We're going to use the append method with the dot pardon me, append. And this time, instead of using integers, we're going to append the string Sean to the end of it and print A again. And so if we do that, what we get is what we expect to get. Uh, initially, a list from 10 to 100. Now, in many other languages, if we tried to append to an array that wasn't the same type, we would often throw an error. However, within Python, we can go 10 to 100, and we can now append to it a string. Um, finally, uh, as a second example, we can use the reverse method here. And all that does is reverse the list. So these inbuilt methods provide very rapid functionality to manipulate uh, your to manipulate various data product or data types and different objects without having to call uh, built-in functions. Um, so within Python, there is a reverse function which will reverse the list passed, but it's much easier to call the method than the actual function. Now we didn't go over the other data types uh, simply because of time. Um, I will quickly say dictionaries within Python, if you've used IDL, they are very similar to structures with a little bit more versatility than structures. And sets are a different data type, which I'm not familiar with in other languages. Um, they are immutable data types, uh, much like a much like a tuple, they can't be changed once they, do, once they have been defined, but they also do not carry duplicate elements. And so they're, um, they are a versatile data set, uh, data type, but don't often have functionality that I've found within data science. 
Now the links here do give a little bit more information on the different data types. And I would encourage you to click on those. It's a short read to go through the four data types that we've had here, but to go in a little bit more detail within uh, the sets as well as dictionaries. Um, so the final thing I wanna go over today, um, since we're uh, running out of time, is um, one aspect of Python that is different than many languages that you probably work with. And that's the difference between assigning a variable and referencing a variable. So within Python, when you make an assignment of a variable, so if we say a is equal to zero, um, Python doesn't create a copy of that variable. Um, instead, it stores information of where it can find that variable uh, within the memory of the computer. So if we're looking at immutable types, so types that can't change once they've been defined, this typically doesn't do anything surprising, or it doesn't do anything that you wouldn't expect given uh, other languages that you've worked with. However, if we're looking at mutable uh, objects, um, so objects that we can change after they've been defined, like lists, where we were able to change the first element of the list after it was defined, then there can be some unexpected outcomes. Um, now, coming from IDL and how we tend to define arrays, this can be quite problematic. So I've always found it important to flag when I'm talking about Python. And so if we just quickly um, just to cover, uh, just to reiterate, a mutable object, its internal state can be changed. And so this is a list, a set, or dictionaries. Um, this is also many of the arrays that we'll be working with subsequently in NumPy or something like pandas are, immuta are mutable objects. So immutable objects, their internal state can't be changed. And so this is something like numbers, uh, strings, and tuples. And so if we do a quick example, on just defining an integer, um, as well as then defining a list and creating what we might think is a copy of it, we can see how these different or how an immutable and immutable objects work differently. So if we define a variable a equal to zero, and then we say b is equal to a, and then change b to say b is equal to two, we're gonna get what we typically think is gonna happen. Initially, a is gonna be set to a. A is going to be set to zero, B is then going to be set to zero, but then we're going to change B to two. So when we print A and we print B, we're going to have um, zero and two. Now within Python, we can use the idea, the ID function in order to um, determine the, uh, vari the variable A and the variable B, B and what their uh, ID is um, within the within the compiler. And so if we run this, uh, what we get is something very, something intuitive, what we think, zero and two. Uh, A's unique identifier is this long integer and B's unique identifier is a slightly different integer. So these are both referencing different points within the computer memory. And so this is what happens when we use immutable objects. However, if we run, if we do the same thing with a mutable object, we get something very different. So if we create a new, shorter, simpler list, we can say A is equal to one, two, three. Um, we can print A, print B, B is equal to A. Um, so if we initially run that, oh, sorry, we're gonna stop from the last one. If we initially run that, we get a new list and we get B is equal to two as it was defined in the last cell. Now, if we say B is equal to A, and then set the first element of B to zero, and if we print A and print B, we get something slightly different. So A was initially one, two, three, but now that we've set B equal to A and set B zero equal to zero, the first element of A also sets changes to zero. And so this is the difference between immutable and an immutable language or um, immutable variable. Now, I found this quite uh, not confusing, but frustrating initially when I started working with Python. And the reason for that is within IDL, in order to speed up the language when you're creating large arrays, you often create an array A that is very large. And if you have another array, which is going to be similar and a similar data type to A, you just say B is equal to A. 
And that's a very rapid array, a rapid way of creating large variables within IDL. However, in Python, that doesn't work um, because B and A are both going to reference the same location within memory. So if we continue down the example, if we set A zero to five, what we notice is that both B and A, the first element changes to five. And if we set B two to zero, the first element of A and, or the, sorry, the last element of A and B also changed to zero. Now we can see that if we print it, if we print the unique identifier, unlike when we were working with integers, immutable objects, what we get is the identifier for A and B is both the same. Now, this is a pretty key concept within Python. And so I would also recommend having just a quick read over the other two links here, which are gonna give a little bit more details on mutable and immutable objects. So the final thing, is operators. Uh, within Python, the operators are very similar to what we have in other languages. We have addition, subtraction, uh, multiplication, division, modulus, exponent, and floor division. Um, comparison and assignment operators are all very similar to what we have in other languages. Uh, the link here will just show all of the different operators that you can get within Python. Uh, for comparison, we use symbols instead of letters. Uh, equal to is two equal signs, not equal to is exclamation mark equal. Greater than or less than is what we expect and same with greater to or equal. And finally, assignment um, like C um, and in some IDL, we do have, we can assign variables um, using equal sign, uh, but then we can also use the plus equals notation in order to uh, say that C is equal to C plus A. Um, so again, this tends to speed things up. Um, and I've often found that this notation is personal preference as to whether or not you use it in your other languages. Um, so with that, that brings us to the end of today's tutorial, um, which is we've managed to stay on time, which is great. Uh, we do have a little bit more homework. Um, one of the things that we found or that we thought was important is slicing that we've gone over, to, over today. That's gonna to be one of the biggest differences that you see in Python than you have in other languages. And so there are a few simple exercises to work through just to get an idea of what slicing and indexing is like in Python. Uh, the other thing we want to focus on is fill out the survey. Uh, let us know what you wanna see in the future and what other tutorials you might wanna like um, so that we can start finding speakers for those. Um, last week, Barbara did point everyone to the um, Heliophysics Python website. It has a list of all the Python uh, packages, not all of them, but many of them that are available within Heliophysics. If there's a package there that you'd like and like to see a tutorial on that, please let us know and we can try and work with the developers to get one of those tutorials in the future. Uh, some quick highlights. Um, so there is a Python Heliophysics coming up. Uh, it is being run by Python in Heliophysics as well as the European Space Agency. It is being hosted in Spain as well as virtual. It's free and it's the 30th of May until Friday, June. So it's a week long course. Um, it looks like it's gonna focus largely on Python packages within Heliophysics, but this is gonna be, if you're thinking of moving from MATLAB or IDL to Python, this is gonna be a really great resource uh, with great speakers, um, Many of the people talking are developers of the packages, so it's gonna be a really great opportunity to very quickly learn about Helio, our Python and Heliophysics. Uh, the other thing we wanna quickly point out is that there is a special issue uh, within the frontiers um, of astronomy and space sciences, the new journal in physics, that is gonna have a special issue in Python. Uh, if you work within Python and if you have a package that you would like to introduce to the community, this will be a great place that will have or that you'll be able to do that. Um, I do want to say abstracts are due by the end of the end of May and manuscripts are due by the end of July. So there's some time to work on it, but both those deadlines are quickly approaching. Uh, finally, our next seminar is April 4th, 
we will have our third early career seminar. Um, Ramiz Kudis will be talking about a comparative study of reconnection X line predictions on the dayside magnetopause of the Earth. And Man Wa will be discussing radiation belt electron acceleration driven by very low frequency transmitter waves in near Earth space. And you can find both of their abstracts on the main magnetosphere seminar under the abstract tab. So thank you everyone. Um, I have not been able to follow the chat as I've been going through this. Um, I hope questions were answered, uh, but if there are any other questions, uh, please let us know. Um, and please do have a look at the survey. Uh, this will help guide us to what we do in the future. Thanks to everyone who helped answer questions in the chat. That was really handy, especially for people who are doing comparisons to C. I have not programmed in C for 25 years. And so it was I was learning things about C that I'd forgotten to. <laughs> All right. Uh, well, if no one has any other questions or comments, um, I hope everyone enjoyed the seminar today or the tutorial, and we'll hope to see everyone next week. Uh, have a wonderful week, everyone. <laughs>